So welcome, everybody. Um, thank you so much for <clears throat> making the time to come to our session today. Uh, <clears throat> today, we're going to be talking about this idea of unconsortium, which is what we hope is going to be the, the next phase of collaboration in higher education. <clears throat> I'm Zach Chandler. I work at Stanford University. And with me today is Brian Wood from UC Berkeley and Sean DeArmond from UC Davis. So um, some of you uh, in the audience may have heard me talk about this before, um, but I'm really excited to tell you that uh, today we're going to be unveiling something at DrupalCon, and uh, it's not just an idea anymore. Uh, so from, you know, this was born at Bad Camp, and we uh, connected with colleagues on the East Coast at, uh, in New York City, Nice Camp, and um, we're really excited to share our progress with you because um, for those of you who connected with us early on, we've actually been working on this since then. So just to lay out the agenda for our presentation today, um, I'm going to start out by stating the, the problem, you know, the, the thing that we're, that we're trying to tackle. Then we're going to um, dive into some real life use cases. Uh, we're going to have a particular proposal for you or a set of proposals. Um, but we're really looking for feedback. We want this to be engaging and we're looking for uh, for ideas from, from everybody. Uh, we're not claiming that we have all the answers, so that's why we're calling them proposals. Um, we are going to be showing you a new website. Uh, we're going to do a live demo, and we're going to share with you some of our uh, code projects. And lastly, if we have time, I don't want to cut short the QA period, but if we have time, and I think we will, um, we'll uh, examine some of what, we, um, what are the known challenges to the, uh, the approach that we're sharing. Okay, um, and immediately after this session, um, there is going to be a birds of a feather um, for higher education broadly. Um, we can dive into the topics we bring in up today, but the, the real purpose of this BOF is just to get everybody who works in higher ed and Drupal together in the same room uh, to, you know, so we can um, get to know each other and find out what our interests are and have a plan for the rest of the week and hopefully other things will spin off of that. So that is in room A107. Um, you can check the BOF boards, um, and it starts at 3.50. So um, there's something that was bothering us, uh, and so we, we have, this is what started this initiative. Um, and the problem is essentially that we are all laboring in isolation on our various campuses, and we keep solving for the same use cases over and over again. And uh, we're not sharing code in any meaningful way with each other. Um, some of us are, uh, connect up to Drupal.org, but there, there isn't a true uh, professional network and community of practice in higher education. Um, this is really counter to how academic communities work, um, where we really want to be standing on the shoulders of our peers instead of reinventing the wheel time and again. And you know, can you imagine what it would look like if the scientific community acted like this instead of you know, peer review? <coughs> Again, so in the next few slides, I'm going to be exploring the problem space. Um, any good project manager is going to tell you that uh, before you embark on something new, you should take a look at what exists uh, for you know, whether it ex succeeded and, and what's available. Um, so we all do that in the Drupal contrib space, but um, how many of us have the, the ability to check with colleagues at other universities? Um, this is, uh, there's currently nowhere uh, to go for this. And this is, there's a lot of, a lot of unrecorded work happening. Some of the things that we're going to have to get over, um, the not invented here syndrome. So we have a tendency to only trust code that we've developed in-house. Uh, and there may also be this, you know, some amount of reputation that we feel is at stake. Uh, we, you know, maybe at MIT they don't want to use a feature built by Harvard or whatever. Um, this is something that just gets in the way, and we need to, to get over this problem and, and undo this, this culture on purpose. Um, another thing I, I would like to talk about is this, this notion of, of peers gets in the way. Uh, so you know, we compete for admissions and things like this, and we're actually required uh, for accreditation to state uh, what our, what our peers, who our peers are, peer institutions and who our aspirational peers are. And I don't think 
uh, this has any place for an open source software development community because we straddle both worlds. Uh, so in an open source, it's not just your imagined peer institutions that matter. Uh, a single talented developer can change everything. And these people work in all sorts of places. So um, we need to think bigger than our, our normal uh, networks. Another problem, and I heard Ezra G talking about this just yesterday, um, that the perfect is the enemy of the good. Um, there's always this tendency to wait for something to be a stable 1.0 release. So we're almost there, but we're just not quite ready to share it. Um, and this is something that we need to actively work against. Um, if we released only perfect, stable uh, projects, um, you know, we might have two features in our whole catalog. Um, and, and instead, I think what we're, we should be striving for is hundreds of imperfect beta and alpha releases. <clears throat> so the, you know, at, at elite institutions, we have this culture of exceptionalism and you know, there's a lot of you know, congratulating ourselves. Um, but really, um, we should be focusing on the fact that this is use case driven work. Drupal is a content modeling system and, and it should be driven by user centered design and use cases. We share the same use cases. So, you know, we're in the same system. Many, many times we're using the same methodology, features based development just being one example. Um, we should be sharing with each other. And I just wanted to challenge you to think about this. You know, imagine what it would look like if we all shared e with each other the projects, whether they're, we think they're ready or not. So that's the problem space, and now we're going to uh, take a look at uh, some actual use cases. Thanks, Zach. So the stuff that Zach's talking about is the stuff that we've been mulling around for the last, I don't know, what, a year and a half or something like that. We've been meeting regularly and talking about this. Um, what I want to show you now is um, kind of what we've been, what we've been doing, some, some real life stuff that we've been doing to try to address some of this stuff. Um, and what I, what I want to get out of this is something real, um, at least a, something like something real that we can t get a, take away from here, that we can take away, that you can take away, um, and how can this really help us all. And so this is the stuff that we've, we've been doing just in our, our little tight-knit group here. So um, who knows about features? Who uses features as part of their development? Yes. Um, okay, well, since a non-zero number of you kept your hands down, let me just do nutshell inside of a nutshell version of what the features module does. All that clickety-click stuff that you do in Drupal to set up content types and views and all that kind of stuff, you can use the features module, which is a Drupal module, it's on drupal.org, and it allows you to package all that clickety-click stuff that you've done um, into a particular use case. You select what you want to, what was part of your use case, and export that into code so it saves your configuration as a module. Technically, it is a module that spits, that, that it spits out. And there's a, few, uh, there's a few really great benefits to that. Um, one, it can be saved in version control. Um, you can revert it back to a known state. So if you go in and change your view and you totally bork something up, you can say, oh, I'm going to revert that, and it goes back. But most importantly, it means we can share it. So once you have a module, once you have a, a, a bundle of code, you can just put it on GitHub or Drupal.org or, or, for God's sake, mail, email it, and you can share it with other people. And so that's what I want to talk about here. We'll talk a little bit more about features later, too. And I also wanted to uh, um, make it clear that we're not, we're going to talk about features here, but that's not um, the, the main focus of, of of, of what we're going to try to share here. It's not necessarily the, uh, the be-all, end-all, and who knows what's going to happen in the future. So um, we're going to talk about features a lot, but consider um, modules or install profiles, um, drush make files, or anything else um, that you want to share as far as code, but also ideas, resources, uh, research, design documents, all that kind of stuff is very, very important. Um, and I'm going to tell you a couple stories about what we've been doing. So at UC Davis, I was visited by our uh, manager of client services, and she says, so, Sean, as part of our ITIL adoption, the ITIL adoption, we need to build a IT service catalog. 
Anybody, does that ring a bell to anybody? Yeah, I thought so. So, um, and so I said, okay, well, we can, we can do that as she described the requirements. I said, oh, Drupal, totally, that's no problem, right? Um, and so we got wireframes built and, and kind of design documents and stuff like that. She did a lot of research about other IT service catalogs. And at one point I mentioned to my uh, colleague Zach here that we were gonna do this and he says, you know, we have a service catalog and we actually already knew that, but we're working on rebuilding it. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. So um, before long, uh, Zach introduced me to Dave Ream at, at Stanford and we were having Google Hangout meetings, we were sharing our research, um, we were sharing our user stories, design documents, wireframes, and uh, as you can see, there's, there, there's not much difference here between these two. Um, but what's gonna come out of this is not necessarily the same uh, feature. We're, w what we decided not to do, because our scope was different between the two, is that we, were, we did all this collaboration and sharing, but we each gonna build our own features. So what does that mean for you guys? It means that now you have two different scopes of two different features for IT service catalog that you might be able to use. And you know, one will end up rising to the top and it'll probably be Stanford's because they're best at everything. But we'll have lots, the, por the purpose of this is to have lots of different varieties of, uh, of different ways of doing things out there. Um, story number two is UC Davis uses CAS and LDAP. And I imagine this is a pretty similar case for a lot of you out there. So I built a feature that saved the UC Davis CAS settings um, and LDAP server settings and basic configuration along with that, as well as kind of a module that, or a, a feature that created user fields um, and as someone logs in with CAS, it pulls from LDAP and saves that information into user fields. Um, not all that complex, but still very useful and we were, we're now implementing that on a number of sites throughout our campus. So I uh, mentioned this to uh, my colleague Brian here, and it turns out UC Berkeley also uses CAS and LDAP. So he says, let me see your, let me see your feature. I send it off to him. Well, there's, if you haven't noticed, there's one problem with that, is that UC Berkeley doesn't care about the UC Davis servers, so my module or my feature right away isn't gonna do them a whole lot of good. Um, but the structure is mostly there. So he was able to take it, change a bunch of the settings to make it fit his particular use case, um, and he's gonna talk a little bit right now um, about what he did with it. Um, what I wanted to mention here too is this is, we wanna really promote the idea of messy, hasty pluralism, and that's kind of a, one of our mantras, and that means it goes along with uh, what Zach said about release early and release often. When I built this, I did not necessarily consider the fact that other people outside of UC Davis might actually wanna use it. So he was able to take this as a, as somebody else, and what would this take to make this feature work for him? Brian. Yeah, so what I got from Sean was uh, not actually that messy, so I couldn't really <laughs> rip it apart and be like, yeah, you know, Davis, they kind of know what they're doing. Um, uh, but um, it was a great opportunity to put on the hat of somebody who hadn't been messing around with the CAS module, the LDAP module, the CAS attributes module, all these cool things that Sean leveraged in order to get LDAP data into a Drupal user uh, entity. Uh, so I, uh, I approached the task uh, saying to myself, okay, um, what does this look like if I just kind of gingerly move forward and don't leverage uh, my past experience? And what I found um, were a couple of obstacles. Well, three, um, exactly. And um, these things um, were interesting to look at and I have a, a couple of ideas about how to make them better. So out of the messiness with uh, small iterations like this mini case study, we can kind of look at, okay, what are some small steps we can take forward? Um, so the first problem I ran into trying to install uh, Sean's feature was that, uh, was a, a, a bit of a shortcoming of the features module, which is features will export certain dependencies for you, like other modules on your site, but third-party libraries are a little bit beyond what it does. So um, Sean's team probably never saw the error that's on the screen because they're always enabling this feature on a UC Davis site that would have PHP CAS in the sites all libraries or, or wherever they decide to put it. 
Um, but if I'm just a user who's maybe installing this for the first time, I might be a little bit blocked by this, this error message. Um, so a way we can avoid this, a simple way, is when we build our feature and we say, hey, you know, this would be a cool thing to share with other people, let's try installing it on a vanilla Drupal 7 and, and see what happens and, and tease out a couple of these uh, potential roadblocks. Um, and then in the next thing that occurred to me is a, is a graceful solution to this problem, which is that um, when you need to uh, bundle up more than what features can give you, um, Drush Make will um, provide for that. And uh, a lot of people think of Drush Make in terms of building an entire Drupal site or an entire Drupal distribution. Yes, th it does do that very well, but there's also a very powerful switch to it called No Core, which will allow you to build just a subset of, uh, of data. Um, and so the, the other thing is that we might not always have the luxury of time to uh, do a nice Drush make file. And so we can, um, with using focused yet effective and brief documentation, I think we can provide the key pieces of information that um, people would need to use this. And I think it would be great if we could all adopt an internal slash external documentation style. A lot of us have that sort of feeling like, well, our team knows that. I don't need to write that down. But a couple of quick bullet points um, can actually serve my team really well too when I have turnover. Uh, new people coming in, somebody fill, fill in the gap uh, for somebody else. And beyond that, it um, in really empowers the community. Um, and then it, thinking about readmes and how they can be more effective or whatever documentation you provide, uh, obviously links to existing documentation, but a really great win, especially in terms of a feature, is maybe just pasting in the Drupal path to the admin pages that have the variables that you have set so that somebody who doesn't know this code can quickly come in there and be like, okay, let me go look at that admin form and there I might see a bunch of UC Davis LDAP servers set and I might need to change those to Berkeley. Um, and then beyond that, we can provide some helpful uh, steps. A, a lot of people might be doing all their Drupal administration via the, the web UI, so we might give them a uh, quick link to, you know, drupal.orgs and enabling and disabling modules and then a couple of bullets like you should do things in this order. We might also tell them, hey, if you enable this feature using Drush, Drush is going to automatically download everything you want for you and save you a bunch of time and maybe give them a sample Drush command. And if we've gone that extra mile to provide our Drush make, um, just pasting in the Drush make command that you use to build it. Um, with maybe another bullet or two, you know, this is what we do, could go pretty far to help someone along being like, oh, maybe I should check out this, this tool. So what's the next step? I, I've, I've modified this feature that I got from UC Davis. I've got it working at Berkeley. Now I want to reuse it at Berkeley. I want to make it reusable um, here. Well, this is kind of where I think we want to create some discussion and get input from the community because there's ways you can re-export features and um, there are issues around um, really making a feature your own. That, that feature I got from Davis is going to have UCD underscore auth in its namespacing. That means its code has functions and um, field names that have that. And that's going to, if it's going to at least create a little confusion at Berkeley and then it potentially could create a conflict depending on what other modules I have installed on my site. And then one step beyond that, what if I say, you know, this guy Sean really knows what he's doing and he, and when he uh, upgrades his code, I would like to get his upgraded code like three months, six months from now and quickly apply my settings to it and just kind of track what he's doing because I really trust what he's doing. There's, there are some strategies for doing that in the, in the larger community and I think um, we could focus uh, on some definitions of those strategies in this community. So um, <clears throat> we've talked a little bit about the problem space and showed you some of the particular use cases that we've been working on. Uh, now uh, it's time for us to share some of our ideas with you and see what bounces back at us. So unconsortium, this is, this is part of our big plan here. 
Um, but what is an unconsortium exactly? Uh, so as we're imagining it, an unconsortium is a professional network of individuals, not institutions. So uh, when institutions are members of things, people start behaving like institutions. So there, you, know, you may have the, the brand of your university at stake in some sort of per perceived way. Um, but people are more interesting and they're mobile. So um, sitting in the front row is Costa Tostiadi. Hey, Costa. Um, so uh, Costa was at the University of Kentucky at their iSchool teaching uh, semester-long courses in Drupal to undergraduates at the School of Information. That's an unusual thing, and that's, that's valuable to Drupal, and we want to know about people like that. So what if the University of Kentucky joined a consortium? Well, shortly thereafter, Acosta moved to the Colorado Boulder, and now he's part of the CU team. So it kind of wouldn't have made sense for Kentucky anymore necessarily in the same way, because it was really about an individual. Um, so. This is, um, this is part of, um, of the way that we're defining ourselves and the way that we're imagining interacting with people and, and groups. So um, we're gonna propose that we establish a community of practice. Now that means something really specific. Uh, so there's the community of practice, capital C, capital P, is, is really a, a variety of learning community um, focused on practical application of technique. People who, who teach each other, uh, you know, uh, actively engaged in a community, and this is one of the things that, that people realized that this uh, really got started in the 90s, um, looking at, at, at corporations and how they work and how people learn there, uh, is that um, you know people teach each other outside of, of a formal curriculum. And I think that this is gonna be, uh, this whole thing that we're talking about doing with features and how atomic to make them and what should be in a feature and what, sh what shouldn't, this is something that we're gonna learn by doing um, we know that we don't have all of the answers, uh, but I think that a lot of the answers might be in this room. Uh, so we also want to be entrepreneurial. We want to fail faster and succeed sooner. So we're going to try lots of things. Uh, we looked at F servers. We looked at F adding RSS feeds to F servers and then parsing those, and we're going to show you something completely new today. Um, but it's all about um, learning from failures as much as from successes. Um, Something else that we're proposing is that um, uh, I, I imagine that the, the types of features that we're all going to be making because we share use cases are going to follow a sort of bell curve distribution, the middle of which the preponderance of these features are going to be things like courses, events, news, people, bibliography. I think a lot of these things are going to be shared, but we're gonna, there's going to be some very, very interesting outliers uh, towards the ends of the distribution, um, and specifically I'm thinking about things like the digital humanities community and the kinds of ways that they might be leveraging uh, um, you know, features and techniques like this. Um, is John Keeley here? Hey, John. So um, John Keeley is from the University of California, San Francisco, and there they've used, so he's partnered with faculty, teaching faculty and research faculty um, to create uh, a Drupal instance that encodes uh, for, g for genomics. So they have you know, common Drupal tools that is sort of like unimpressive necessarily to a Drupal developer, but applied to a domain, it becomes really interesting. So they have these long gene sequences uh, and I think um, uh, RDF extensions and suddenly uh, you have yourself a really viable academic research tool. Um, so it's those outliers down at the edges that I think are gonna surprise us. Uh, and the other thing that we're proposing is to think bigger than we normally do. Uh, so this initiative is already going to happen. It's already happening in California. I mean, if you know Berkeley and Stanford can work together on something, then you know probably the rest of us can get along too. Um, but uh, you know, so why wouldn't we expand it? You know, why would we why would we focus on a small problem, a locality, uh, when we could try to solve a much bigger one? So um, the internets have already solved the whole scale and geography limitations. So why would we be regional anymore? Um, so um, I'm gonna resist the urge to do a drum roll on this. So we have a website. So the, um, the EDU Drupal and Consortium now has a website which is currently running on Pantheon. Thank you very much, Pantheon. Um, and in it, 
um, we are going to try to do, well, four things at least. Um, provide a catalog of features that have been made at more than one place. Um, hopefully all the places. Um, we are going to have a place for people to network and connect. Uh, we're going to show community members and their institutional affiliation. Um, we will be blogging, uh, you know, as a way to foment this community of practice and share, you know, things that we've tried and things that have tried and haven't worked or things that are working. Um, and lastly, we also have a proof of concept tool um, that um, is Brian Wood's work that we're going to um, show you a little bit of, perhaps. Um, so, and we're open for membership right now. So if you go to this URL, uh, you can create an account. Uh, and um, join us. Yeah, right now. Um, <laughs> and I'll turn it over to my friend Sean. So, what Zach was talking about, the unconsortium, how it's member driven, not institution driven. Notice we have a page for members, not a page for institutions. Um, and already this slide is outdated because Zach just asked a bunch of people last night to go and create accounts. So, you'll see there's a lot more people on there than just this. Um, we do urge you to fill out your, uh, fill out your profile, you know, institution, also interests. Um, there's a field for your Drupal.org uh, user page, um, the URL for that, if you have that picture. Things always look better if, they're, if you have your mugshot on there, I think. So get that in there. Um, the other thing that you'll find in there, and I'm going to mention this now just so it doesn't throw you off, is that there's a checkbox that says, I work for a higher education institution, and that checkbox is required um, for now, I'll say, for now. So we're really trying to focus on people who are at higher education institutions right now. We want to be able to expand that to um, other, other companies and service providers that are very interested in the, in the higher education space. We, we will have a place for you, or we will have a place for you. Right now, we just want to focus on the, uh, the higher ed folks, though, so you'll see that. Um, also, there's another checkbox that we're not going to display on the site anywhere, but we're interested in finding out and connecting with you further. There's a checkbox for I have code to share. So if you have code to share, check the I have code to share box so that we can get in touch with you and try to figure out where you're sharing it and how we can be able to figure out um, how to bring that in on the site. Um, but we don't have enough in there. We need more. So go ahead and go ahead and do that as soon as you can. Um, so I'm going to turn this over to Brian, who's going to show you a pretty wicked tool here. Do we still have display on the screen? I can't see what's going on up there. Okay. Well, we have, we're on the same video. I just switched it. You're right. Okay. Um, so, so one of the, one of the premises of this uh, this grassroots movement is uh, your use case is not unique, and somebody's probably already created something that has uh, covers a fair bit of your requirements, and you should go find it before you reinvent the wheel. So that's a nice idea. Um, where am I going to go find my code by my peers at other institutions? Uh, well, we, we've been putting some thought into this, and uh, one of the first places you might go look for code would be on Drupal.org. And uh, Drupal.org now has a brand new education category under Download and Extend. Uh, and you will find uh, 20 to 30 uh, modules, install profiles, et cetera, there. Um, so that's, that's one small step. Um, you know, if we try and do searches, um, if I tried to do a search, I didn't know Sean and I wanted to find his feature, you know, I, I might have had some problems getting to him via Google. I could have tried some more focused searches of GitHub and Bitbucket. Um, but uh, how can we make this better? We, we thought about the fact that a lot of what we want to do um, has to do with features, and there is the F server project. The F server can um, is a way of broadcasting to the community the existence of your feature or module, uh, and it can provide feeds, which could be aggregated centrally. But as I thought about it more, I feel like F server is a bit of a barrier to participation. First of all, you have to install the thing, and then you've got another site to maintain, and most of us don't need extra sites. Um, and then the project itself ha perhaps has an uncertain future. There's no 7x release of it. And um, there's relatively low adoption if you look at the downloads. So um, what can we do? Well, I think that 
code should be allowed to be hosted in disparate locations. We shouldn't tell anyone they have to host their code anywhere. I'm, hopefully all of you would consider at least hosting your code on Drupal.org if it's Drupal code because that's a, a great place for it and, and keeps the community strong. Um, but we are, we are assuming that there's going to be code on GitHub, Bitbucket, and then probably in um, private repositories at different institutions. So how can we facilitate the creation of a rich me metadata catalog that would point um, the community at this code? Um, I want to show you some bleeding edge work uh, that, uh, that may facilitate that. Um, we, uh, I was thinking about what would it take to let somebody uh, upload some kind of, create a, create a registry, um, upload just one piece of code. And um, when I thought about that, I thought, well, telling them to upload a .info file might be a good first step because that way I normalize my data um, and I take the name of whatever their, uh, whatever their project is from the machine name and I can um, get some other interesting information from the info file, for instance, uh, dependencies that their code has. Um, so the first thing I did was create a simple form that allows you to upload an info file and it requires a download URL um, because I'm kind of assuming if you're not going to tell us where to go get your code, we don't even, you know, having the information is not that useful. Uh, there's no title on this because the title is going to be automatically derived. I'm not going to actually run this um, because it's of limited use. I, if you have any kind of interested, interesting code, you probably have eight info files. Um, you've probably got a collection of modules or a feature that has, a whole, um, has created a whole bunch of info files. So wouldn't it be cool if we could give a Drupal site um, a code repository? and have it go look in the repository, identify Drupal code, and, um, and bring some kind of uh, um, information about that code back to the site. So one such repository exists uh, here. This is actually some slightly older stuff that was done at Berkeley. And um, it's got a bunch of different things in it. Uh, it's got a theme. Um, this is like an entire Drupal core, um, a branch from um, Pantheon. And then it's got some modules. Um, and these, these modules have configuration in it. So uh, the next thing I attempted was uh, to use the GitHub API to actually go get um, information from a repository. And basically what it does is um, it just finds the repository you give it and it looks through all of the projects in that repository for info files and then it parses them and creates nodes. So everyone cross your fingers and pray to the demo gods um, because this is the boldest thing I've ever done. <laughs> so we'll, we'll uh, use our little autocomplete institution field and um, we'll say please work. <laughs> Actually, I'm too nervous even to type that. Uh, not that I haven't tested this like 20 times. Um, and so, so right now, um, a bunch of REST requests are happening. And uh, on my local host, this actually choked a little bit, but Pantheon um, performs pretty well. Needless to say, this would be a great place to implement something like Q or the Batch API um, or something like that so that um, users have an idea what's going on. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, <laughs> applause at DrupalCon. That <laughs> life mission fulfilled. Um, that's, that's awesome. Uh, so what, what's, what's happened here is we've created a whole bunch of different nodes and um, let's take a look at what they look like. Um, basically, um, an interesting one might be, say, um, one of these modules. Um, and what we've got here is uh, kind of messy stuff, um, but uh, we, we, from the info file, we've got um, the core, we have uh, the machine name, and um, we have uh, what dependencies. This depends on Drupal's SMTP module. Um, and then we've pulled in data from GitHub, so we have the version control URL, so we could run a git clone command with that. 
And then um, download URL honestly needs a little more work. That's not exactly right. Uh, the HTML URL is um, a link to the page, the HTML page for the project on GitHub. Um, so what, um, what we get in our finished site um, is the ability to create a view um, that looks like this one that has um, received some theming love from Zach Chandler, um, listing a bunch of uh, projects that um, these have been pulled both from that Berkeley repository and from Stanford's repository. So if you scroll down here, you'll see some Stanford themes and stuff like this. Um, and then further, of uh, uh, further interest, um, since I, I figured it wouldn't be that hard to, um, to try and identify what code we've actually retrie retrieved here. So you'll notice there's this code type column, which um, basically has, uh, as, the, as the projects have been discovered, I've looked for um, the identifying factors of a core installation or, the, or what the things I would see if I'm looking at a theme or um, whether I'm looking, do, did I find a dot module file and a dot info file and is there a dot make file? So then I, if, I, if so, I found modules with drush make files, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's a few things here that are unknown. This is actually some experimental stuff that probably shouldn't be in there. Um, <laughs> and there's like some That's random fancy. admin scripts and stuff like that. So, there's always unpublish. <laughs> oh, okay. We need to move forward now. Uh, <coughs> challenges. Are we on challenges? Good. Okay. So, let's do a quick time check. We have a little over 20 minutes, so I think that's enough time to go through some of these challenges before we before we start taking questions. And. Uh, I'm sure you've, uh, you smart people have already come up with the stuff that totally is going to make this not work. And believe me, we have too. Um, so let's just, for the sake of uh, brevity, let's just go through some of these and, uh, and just say, yes, we know we've thought of this and we need your help to fix it. So the first thing, big challenge that we're going to have is we really want to establish um, best practices for building features or, or other sorts of, uh, of projects. And, uh, so we talked a little bit about that before, and uh, Brian outlined some really interesting points about documentation and making sure that features are abstracted to a point that they'd be useful for other people. Um, we know about Kit, the Kit spec, um, which is on Drupal.org, and that's cool. We definitely, we definitely use that, but it doesn't go far enough. And so we want to go even further than that um, to establish much more specific namespacing guidelines, um, but exactly what those namespacing guidelines um, means uh, we're, or, or what exactly they're going to be. We haven't quite figured that out yet. Um, we would really like to be able to publish um, a guide on namespacing um, and how do we deal with overrides. So if somebody takes the, your, your feature and they, uh, they update it, they, ch they change some of the views or, or they change some settings, you're going to see that big fat over overridden uh, button on, on the features thing. So how do we how do we handle that? What's the best way to deal with that so that um, uh, so that your site will be maintainable for the future? And so we really need to establish these best practices um, and publish them to the site in the form of blog posts or some sort of FAQ. Or we really want to be able to say, okay, um, if you really want to offer the best sort of thing, best sort of code for the community, these are the guidelines that you can that you can follow. Um, and uh, so I talked about namespacing a little bit, so that's a big thing. So that's not only namespacing your feature as a particular, um, as, as the name of the feature, like we always namespace everything as UCD underscore something or other. Um, but what about content types and fields and views, panels, taxonomy? What about if you have like a feature set that has four or five different um, features inside of it and they're all kind of bundled together for a particular use case? Um, also, rename spacing, Brian mentioned that briefly. Well, how does he change all that from UCD auth to UCB auth um, for the feature that I gave him? And so there's going to be a whole lot of find and replace that's going to have to happen. Like maybe there, we could build a tool that does that, like the coder module that upgrades things from six to, six to seven. So the, 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 these, are, these are opportunities that are available to us to, to really make this work. 
Um, also, uh, we have some difficult questions like, okay, we've been talking about features a lot, right? But in Drupal 8, we have this wonderful, glorious thing called the Configuration Management Initiative, and we have a whole totally different way of managing configuration as code in Drupal now. So what does that mean for the features module specifically? Um, we don't know. There, I don't think anybody's actually made a full upgrade. The features module may still exist as simply an, an upgraded UI to the to the configuration management um, system in Drupal core, or maybe this idea of apps will come out, and, that, and that's been gaining a lot of momentum as well in Panoply and other, um, in other distributions. And so maybe that's the way that, that we still need to, to focus. So once again, features is kind of what we talked about, but that's not everything. There's, there's gonna be more, and we just don't know what's gonna be in the future, but we as a community can help guide that as well. Um, and so we also wanna hear from you. What else are we missing? Like what, um, what things do we need to have that'll help you guys in um, communicating with each other and uh, sharing resources? And imagine yourself as a brand new, um, you're a Drupal developer in a, in a university that has never done Drupal before. So what, what would you need to really get, to get up and running? We wanna be able to figure that out. And the community will really guide all this. So join us. So we think this is worth doing. We know it's gonna be hard, and we know we're gonna need lots of smart people to work with us. We know that uh, we're focused on professional technologists that work in higher education, but we really wanna partner with agencies and leverage their Drupal know-how and their commitment to higher ed. Uh, and I know that some of them are in the room right now, so we're, um, you know, we're looking forward to working with you directly on that. Um, so the, please visit the website, edudo.org. Uh, it's very raw, it, uh, you know, it's a work in progress, this is a volunteer initiative, uh, and um, if you join us, you can help us make it better. Um, we're, we're imagining that this is an organization that's gonna be governed by members, and uh, by working for a college or university, being in Drupal, you're automatically a member, it is free, please come join. Um, so, you know, what, we're, what we are gonna set out to do, and you know, we have these challenges ahead of us, but um, you know, one of the foundational principles of open source is that many eyes tame complexity. So we want to take that principle and leverage it for things that matter to us every day in higher ed. Um, so we think that we have built a viable collaboration platform. Um, we don't want to take anything away from Drupal.org. I think instead what we're talking about is harnessing work, recording work that is currently unrecorded. And we're gonna make Drupal stronger by doing that. Uh, so we invite you all to go to the website and make accounts and um, help us kick this off. We're starting today. Thank you very much. So um, I see that we have a mic up front here, and I think for the sake of recording, um, if you guys want to cue at the mic, that would I know that um, uh, the DA and DrupalCon would appreciate that. So if you have any questions, um, you can ask us now, or uh, we also have the follow-up off, and we're gonna, of course, be around. Hi, I'm Matt Garrett from the University of Kansas. Um, I got a quick question. So I went to your site. I see that you have all your code posted. I didn't see a spot for, hey, I wanna do this. Is anybody else doing this? Do you have something like that? I think that that is gonna be like the killer thing that we do. Okay. It's not like, what have I done, but what are we about to do? Right. Uh, so. Yeah, we kind of need some, th some way to do that. Okay. Um, there's a bunch of things missing that I imagine that we could leverage. You know, we have commenting turned on for projects, but we don't have things like flag or five star, um, you know, up, down voting. I think we need some mechanisms to have the best work float up. Um, and I think that, you know, like we said, there's probably gonna be like a dozen course features. You know, maybe the best one ends up on Drupal.org and we have this nomination mechanism, but I think, um, being able to identify colleagues with shared problems and collaborate like the way that we did with UC Davis on our service catalog, I think, I think that's the future for the organization. Thanks. Hi, um, Mike Jennings. I work for the Department of Energy. And um, would it be possible for it to join the site even if you're not in a higher learning institution? Um, my organization funds a lot of, of the research and development in universities and so on and so forth. And we're interested to you know, follow activities like the one you're doing here. 
Um, I will say absolutely soon. Um, <laughs> as our uh, kind of minimum viable product, this is really what we wanted to get out, but we will absolutely have a place for um, public and private institutions to be able to join um, and in, in some manner or another. And really, you can benefit from this already. Like, I don't think there's any sort of permission set so once you're logged in, you can see more stuff. You can still go to the site. You can still see everything that's there. Okay. You can see all the people that are there and contact them however you feel you want to. We definitely want to be able to um, involve everybody, but in the interest of... Uh, well, presenting at DrupalCon, we really had to narrow our focus, um, and, and the fact that we all have real jobs. Um, we really had to narrow our focus. So yes, I'm glad you're excited about this. I'm glad, there's, I hope there's gonna be a lot of people that are excited about this. Is there a news and blog part of the site already? There's a blog part of there, and there's, okay. um, Brian's already written a number of blogs. All right. um, you have comments just for logged in users, I think? Yeah. Okay, so that is the one functionality. Well, we is that yeah, we can revisit about it, but right now for comments, you do have to be logged in to, to leave comments. That's enough to follow along. Okay. All right, thank you. Thanks. Actually, can I follow up on that? Yeah. yeah. I just want to follow up on that a little bit because I was really concerned. I, 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 I imagined this question exactly, and I was like having this debate with Zach, who, and, and now I really understand sort of one, one idea Zach has. And it's not that we don't we want to hide anything from other communities. We definitely want to be as open as possible. Zach's, Zach's thought was um, when we start having people submit projects using some of this code that needs to be you know made a little better, um, it will be a really rich community for higher education if we have a focused domain of code. But that doesn't mean that we couldn't clone off a site like this and create uh, you know another section for another community or another domain like um, government or something like that? Um, well, one thing that my office might be interested to do would be to promote your group, especially to um, recipients of our grants and things like that. So uh, I'll follow along on the blog. Great, appreciate thank that. you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hi, thank you for your presentation. I'm Daniel from the University of Oregon. My question is, how did you, how's the university deal with licensing of your code? Uh -huh. Is that right. me? That's All a right. DC question. <laughs> You're right, that's tough. <laughs> 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 yeah, so there's, that's a big problem. And um, it's something that University of California is currently dealing with right now. Um, you know, I, I tried to hide it, but you, you brought it up anyway. So what I gave to Brian, since he was UC, I could give it to him, right. but I couldn't give it to you yet. Believe me, we have uh, people embedded in the organization that are very interested in doing this and we're, we're, we're proposing change as we can, um, but that can be difficult to do. And different um, institutions have very different rules about that. Um, he's already got, the Stanford's already got a feature server set up and they're sharing a bunch of that stuff. Um, Berkeley, you do too, right? You, he has uh, some GitHub stuff that he's sharing that's already available. So it's kind of it's spread out. Um, and uh, and I don't know, it will really have to do with whatever we can get from your institution. If you have a public um, repository, a public GitHub account, or something that you're already sharing, we'll, we'll take it. If not, we don't really have anything to look at, right? right. And it, so we, we want to encourage you to, uh, to share your code, and we want to encourage you to make uh, whatever changes inside your own university's policy is necessary, um, as we're doing. Um, but uh, if it's out there, we'll take it. And if it's not, well, there's not much we can do about that. Okay. Yeah. The, um, the one thing I would add to that is that there's, you know, there's some amount of risk taking with this. I mean, it, you're, you're you know, becoming a change agent for your university, perhaps. And um, well, Drupal is GPL. Uh, so you know, all of the, you know, so that, that can be a challenge for some, some cases. So, so uh, Stanford's OK with us releasing GPL. I think other universities might prefer another license. Um, which creates conflict for putting things on DDO, which is part of the reason why we're doing this. Um, but another thing that's important to think about is that at its heart, uh, features is about, uh, uh, it's, it's configuration. You know, yeah. I, d I didn't sit down and, and, and write code from scratch for some of the features I've made. Um, it's, it's bundling config. So I don't, I, I think that you have a, you know, a, a reasonable case that this is, this is config, it's not creative work, it's not the university's IP. Uh, my name's Ernie Gillis. I'm at Berkeley College of Music in Boston. 
Um, so I'm, when you mentioned about the humanity side of things, that's a lot of beacons went off in my head. Um, the questions I have is kind of more of on the site, if there's resources to help people start to learn about either kind of what you alluded to, how to talk to the upper management folks to try and say, hey, here's how we can help share, look what's going on, all these kinds of things, or even just interdepartmentally, because some colleges are not necessarily able to share across departments. Um, also, possibilities of maybe looking into how to even go into sharing some sort of MOOCs or something to help do trainings on all the kind of stuff to help just broaden that community and bring it more forward. I think that's a great idea. Um, we have, I mean, right now our, the platform of our website, um, we, we could do that through a blog post. Um, and uh, want to write it? <laughs> uh, I, I don't mind so, helping. Yeah, yeah, I just, uh, so yeah, w w I think that would be a great idea to be able to have that kind of stuff. And also, I think, you know, I'm not a lawyer, but um, companies like Acquia and Pantheon and the, the big companies that, that do open source, like, for a living and make a lot of money at it, they have lawyers and they're very, very vested in, in, in making code available. Um, and so uh, it's possible we can leverage the Drupal Association or, or other companies that, to, to be able to help us with that as well. Um, and yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and I think some of these topics about you know uh, creating change in your campus and managing up and things like that, I'm, I might prefer to have an offline conversation about sure. those tactics. No, I'm just curious if, if <laughs> about, creating, uh, about making a resource space on this to kind of help the community mm -hmm. learn more of how to do it. Yeah. That's, that's a great yeah. idea. Hi, my name is Ken Newquist. I'm from Lafayette College. I think uh, sharing recipes is awesome. The last two things I worked on, or my group worked on before I got here, were LDAP CAS and Service <laughs> Catalog. <laughs> uh, one of the things that I'm actually, Lafayette's been a part of for the last couple of years is we created this uh, ad hoc group of colleges to support Moodle, liberal arts colleges mm -hmm. to support Moodle. And one of the things that we found really helpful were we do, um, every six months we do what we call hack doc events where we just get together. It's 20 to 30 people in a room hacking. There's instructional technologists there helping out. And I think having some sort of event where people can kind of touch base every few months would be yeah. mm -hmm. fantastic. Either tagged on to DrupalCon or a Drupal camp or something that people can get to. Um, let, me, can I, let me address that real quick. So um, we mentioned Bad Camp a few times. And the, where this all came together, and we've been doing it for two years now, is there's a higher education summit at Bad Camp that we do um, every year. And Zach and I have been organizing that for the last two years. Um, and uh, that's kind of been our, our pseudo platform for, for bringing people together. And we, we presented kind of a very, very early vision of this um, this past year. But I can see that as being a platform for moving this forward in the future as well. Sounds great. I had one other quick thing that we've been running into, which was we find modules that we'd like to use, uh, Homebox, um, that haven't seen a lot of updates lately. So I think one of the things we're also looking for, in addition to this kind of thing, yeah. is identifying other people who are interested in being co-maintainers on yeah. projects that just aren't mm -hmm. getting enough love. Or maybe you're doing it in-house, but you're not committing back because you're afraid that everyone's going to start swamping you with requests. Yeah. So thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Oh. Hi. Um, I'm Danny Norton, a UX designer, also working with Berkeley College of Music, oddly enough, in a different department than Ernie over here. Um, I'm very intrigued by the idea of a knowledge base and sort of a, a repository of code, but I'm also wondering if you are, guys are thinking about a repository of knowledge um, that goes beyond blog posts. Um, but also, you know, we talk about defining best practice, who actually defines what the best practice is, and then where is the best practice actually cataloged? Um, so I don't know if you guys were thinking about curating that at all or what was going on there. Well, I think for best practices, um, we would be building on Drupal's um, nature of, you know, the duocracy. So like it's kind of the best practices are going to come out of people that are trying to do it. Um, and then just us having a form for comparing notes. Um, mm -hmm. The, you know, the fundamental trick of what we're talking about here is getting, you know, features in other code. Um, that were built by you know disparate teams to work together in the same place. Mm -hmm. So we have the you know there's the kit specification, which is about um, making sure these things work together inside of a distro. But this is a whole other level of complexity. Mm -hmm. So I think that you know as soon as we start thinking that way, like you know earlier Brian was saying, he was suddenly imagining the work he was doing being used by somebody else. I mm -hmm. think that triggers uh, some changes in the way that we work. Um, so yeah, I can imagine that we would definitely be interested in documenting that. 
you know, on our website for, for broad reuse value and sharing with all sorts of other communities, you know, government and others. Because, um, you know, some of our things are, are really domain specific and it matters that mm -hmm. we're all in higher ed, but, um, you know, some of them have broad reuse value and we're going to want to share as much as we can. Excellent. Um, and one other thing, I'm also helping organize Design for Drupal this year, which is next month, and I'd love to invite you guys to submit this session or another session at D4D because there's a lot of folks in the higher ed community, and I would love to see a talk on this very topic. So just wanted to put that out there. Where is that? Um, it's in Boston, actually, on MIT campus. It's design for the number four Drupal.org, and just go there and you'll see it. Awesome, thanks. And a, and a real quick follow-up on, on your question about um, how best practices might evolve. Just, I'll share my imagination. I, you know, very hastily threw up, you know, a bunch of blog posts, which actually, I, you heard almost everything in my blog posts. There might be a little more detail. But my thought is, like, talk about my experience adapting this thing. Talk about some improvements I see. Get some conversation going on about that. Maybe another, maybe some other people, we can't do all the content on the site. Hopefully some of you will too. And um, eventually, you know, we distill that into a document. Like here's, here's our, our 0 0.1 version of, of a best practice. I like that. And I also want to put forth that the thing you did for code and creating the metadata for code would work really, really well with knowledge base articles and blog posts from other places. Yeah, if you put them all on GitHub. <laughs> no, you could. I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Yeah, I love. I would love to invent something else. So, hi, I'm Shane McKinney. I'm from ImageX Media. Uh, I just actually just kind of follow up and tie in that a little bit as well. I'm more of a. I'm a developer, so I look at things on the code side of things. So, uh, as far as having a, a knowledge base and, and code and, and doing practice is great, but I also want to do something on the code level. So, what you have shown to me is you have a repository of finished work more so than anything at the moment, and you were talking about you wanted to start doing more collaboration. Um, so now I'm looking at this as a list of stuff that could be in progress, but it could be in progress in GitHub, it could be in progress in Drupal.org, um, and you're trying to get it into one place. Now I'm looking for, you know, as a developer, uh, how do I get in and help start collaboration, uh, collaborating with these guys that are working on this? Uh, are you going to provide any extra tools or support on that to allow me to join those developers and those Piece, uh, groups that are doing this work, uh, and also on the flip side, things outside of um, outside of your, organ your organization, these guys are working on a specific EDU task. Also, you guys need some help too. <laughs> that looks at things. You need some work. How do we get in touch with yourself to b build out some features for you uh -huh. uh, for the things to like adding these collaboration tools? Do you have a list somewhere? Right, right. Yeah. Um, one thing I've imagined in terms of um, collaboration is that. Uh, now that, now that we can communicate with the GitHub API, we can also um, get information about forks um, of code. And so um, we could figure out a way to uh, expose um, sort of uh, originating projects and forks um, on the site so, so, and create relationships you know, using Drupal um, to, to show, OK, here's, I don't know, um, a Stanford uh, WYSIWYG feature, something that ImageX took and um, took to the next level. Um, but and you know that one's over here. Here's the relationship, just similar to what we have on GitHub. It might actually that might be reinventing the wheel too much of what's on GitHub, but I think it might have some value because you could keep it within this community. You could show these relationships really clearly um, in one space, um, in one domain of code, being higher education. Um, so that. Uh, and there was a second part to your question, which no. Yeah, the second question was, you know, specifically for your organization and how do we help contribute to right. those tools for your side of things? Like, how do I help build out these tools for EDU, DU? Like, w w what, what, do, what Is there do something you as universities? Can we contribute towards furthering this site for you? I kind of missed that. Yeah, uh, so um, we don't have an email address yet. <laughs> so um, you can reach out directly to any of us. Um, so we have, uh, so we're imagining a, a group of members that could be many hundreds of people maybe, and we're going to give governance essentially uh, of the organization to them. Um, there is a steering committee, um, Konstantin Tovstiadi, um, Adam Moore from uh, Stanford, uh, Quinn Dombrowski from UC Berkeley, uh, and uh, Brian Allendyke from Penn State University. You can reach out to any of us, um, and we should have our contact info on the site or contact form. Mm -hmm. or yeah. The contact we form, but you need to log in for that. Oh, right yeah. Let's all go to the box. And yeah, so 
Thanks, guys. If you come to the BOF, we'll answer your questions, or we'll walk there with you. How about that? <laughs> I think it's um, A107. I think so. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Great, thank you.